All right, um, I might get us started because uh, there's now more than 100 of us on this room. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm Phil Dawson. I'm the Associate Director of Cradle, which is the Centre for Research and Assessment and Digital Learning here at Deakin University. I'm so happy that you can join us for our second public event for our Cradle Symposium on Challenging Cheating. And before we, we get going, I wish to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm located today. So I'm at Deakin's uh, downtown campus in sort of central Melbourne. We pay our respects to the local people for allowing us to have our gathering on their land and to their elders past, present and future. I invite you to type the location that you're in and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you are located. And I acknowledge that Aboriginal sovereignty has not been ceded. Cradles run one of these annual symposia every year since we got started in 2015. We, I think it was actually 2016 when we ran one on evaluative judgment. And each time we tried to get together a bunch of people who otherwise wouldn't have talked with each other about a topic. We've tried to pick challenging topics and we've talked about evaluative judgment, we've talked about feedback, we've talked about inclusion in assessment and other topics. And we thought for this year we'd go for something maybe even more challenging. I'm not sure. The, the topic of cheating. Um, cheating over the course of the pandemic and even before has become a really big deal. It's become at the forefront of our minds over that period Australia passed criminal legislation where if you help somebody to cheat in a commercial capacity, you can go to jail for up to two years and face $110,000 of fines. Um, cheating's become big business as well. And companies that I, I don't want to declare are cheating companies because I've been told I shouldn't go and do that, um, have you know, at the peak of the pandemic been worth more than 10 billion US dollars, just one individual company that you can find for yourself, because I don't want to name it. Now, this panel that we're holding is partway through our symposium. We've met for a couple of days, we've talked through the challenging issues of cheating, and we'd like to share with you what we've brought to the symposium, what we are thinking at the moment, how we're trying to think about cheating. Our goal is to really try and pick apart the topic of cheating and maybe reconstitute something new, um, maybe do away with it. Who knows? Just try and move beyond where we currently are. Before introducing our panel, I want to mention a few procedural things about how we're going to be running things today. So firstly, we're going to do brief introductions of ourselves and what we've learned from the symposium so far, what we've sort of brought into it. Uh, each of us on the panel is going to do that, and then we're going to take questions. We'll talk for around an hour, and then we'll do a formal close on the hour. So for us in Melbourne, that's a formal close at four. And then if there's still interest, we'll keep going for another half hour, which for us in Melbourne is till 4.30. It's a Zoom webinar, so your camera and microphone, unless you're on the panel, won't do anything. So feel free to go on a walk and listen to us in your headphones, or if you need to go to the bathroom, take your phone with you. Nobody will know if you do that. Um, feel free to use the chat. Type in whatever you want on the chat. There's normally some great discussions going. However, we on the panel aren't going to be monitoring the chat. So you can definitely have a great chat, but we won't see that because things get pretty fast on the chat sometimes. If you'd like to ask us a question, put it in the Q&A, please. Um, you can click that Q&A button and ask questions, but also vote up questions as well. So you can type your own questions in, but there's also like a little thumbs up thing. If you like a question, if you want us to address it, do that thumbs up. We will probably address most of the questions in the order of those votes. Uh, one final thing is that we will be recording this panel and we're sharing it with a bit of a recap. That usually takes us a week or two to do. So do know that there's going to be an opportunity to share this with other people or to rewatch it yourself. So that's um, the, the intro to the, the panel. Um, 
really love to welcome my panelists today, uh, Dr. Vicky Nagy, Jeannie Patterson, and uh, sorry, Professor Jeannie Patterson and Professor Bruce McFarlane. Um, three scholars that we've selected because they have challenging perspectives on cheating. Um, Vicky, I wonder if you could get us going just by introducing yourself and letting us know sort of what, what do you bring? Hi, everybody. Thanks very much, Phil. Thanks very much for the invitation uh, to be part of this panel and part of the symposium as well. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of Uchruwita, the Palawa and the Nina people. Um, I'm in Hobart at the University of Tasmania. I'm a senior lecturer in criminology. So some people might think that that means what I'm bringing to this panel and to this topic is an idea of criminalization, that we should criminalize uh, cheating in all of its forms and being uh, pro the idea of taking this through the criminal justice system. And I think that's probably to a certain extent, people might think that that's uh, what criminology does. And I think traditionally that's kind of how criminology has kind of thought of its role as well that it's um, an arm of the state, that it's kind of focusing on what is deviant and wrong in society and how we can respond to it and respond to it in, um, you know, the, the idea of going through the courts and fining people or sending people to prison. Um, but I'm more of a critical criminologist, so I take cr a critical stance to uh, traditional criminology. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is not so much um, what criminology um, might traditionally focus on, which is the courts and on um, you know punishment and punitive sort of responses. I'm very much interested in prevention. So that's the sort of angle I come into various topics of uh, crime and deviance that I'm interested in. Um, as people might have seen, I'm interested in a lot of different topics and sort of coming to the, um, the issue of academic integrity um, fairly recently in comparison to a lot of other academics who have been focusing on this uh, exclusively and for an extended period of time. And part of the reason why I've come to it is because of my own experiences being on an academic integrity and misconduct uh, panel and seeing it from the other side. So I think a lot of academics, we see the we see our students, we care for our students, we look at uh, the assessments that our students are producing. Um, and then when there is some um, academic integrity issue that crops up, we get very personal and emotional feelings uh, because of what's happened in that unit that we're teaching. And then if, if it's something that we consider egregious enough, we might send it off to a committee uh, to deal with the issue and kind of it sort of goes away and out of our hands at that point. And experiencing what it was like being on a committee and actually talking to those students and seeing what academics were putting forward and the um, the way that students were responding uh, to uh, the allegations of academic um, misconduct sort of got me thinking about, well, what is it that we do in criminology as a discipline when we think about um, crime prevention? That might be something that we can sort of bring over to this topic. And so even though I talk about it being crime prevention, it's certainly not, uh, there are different ways that we can think about academic misconduct. Some of it might fall under traditional um, definitions of crime and, and deviance, uh, and some of it may not. Uh, so I'm using crime in a very sort of loose and broad term, but not necessarily to mean that um, you know, any, any form of um, academic misconduct should be branded as a criminal act. And so I think that's that's a sort of perspective of what is it that criminology tells us about why um, people may deviate from the norm, why people may um, perform behaviours or participate in behaviours that seem to be counterintuitive to what is good and useful to them, and how is it that sometimes students who we may not see um, struggling or we may not see as having any other problems may go down the path of becoming involved with 
cheating and other forms of academic misconduct as well. And what does that mean for how we, not just in higher education, but in society might think about responding uh, to this issue? Uh, thanks so much, Vicky. Great to have you here. And yeah, we really wanted uh, sort of a criminologist like yourself to, to bring some perspective to this. Um, Jeannie, over to you. Um, thanks so much, Philip, and thanks, Vicky. Um, so I would also like to um, acknowledge that I'm on the lands of Wurundjeri people, uh, and I would like to um, pay my respects to those traditional custodians of the land and to their elders past, present of the Kulin Nation. And I also want to res extend my respect to other Indigenous um, Australians who are present here and now. And um, I guess my interest in this topic comes from um, a perspective of working interest in the growth of surveillance technologies and the increasing surveillance of students, um, which has been the response to both the COVID lockdowns and a concern about increased levels of cheating by students. Um, so perhaps complementary to Vicky, coming from a privacy um, perspective as opposed to a criminology perspective, but not a direct route to the study of cheating. Um, and I'm working with a colleague, a very good colleague, Simon Coughlin, who's a philosopher, and we are interested in the way in which ethics, and in particular virtue ethics, um, can tell us something about the values involved in cheating and in detecting cheating. And, in fact, what we're interested in is how the self-proclaimed values of the university, the virtues that the university says that it itself holds out in society that make it different from any other entity in society, perhaps have something to say about the way the university should approach concerns about both cheating and indeed the surveillance of students. And we um, are very interested in exploring the responsibilities of universities um, to model perhaps the best kinds of behaviour, trusting behaviours, honest behaviours, privacy respecting behaviours, and how this may influence how we respond to, to concerns about cheating within universities. Uh, thanks, Jeannie. Um, and over to you, Bruce. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I, uh, just to explain, I suppose, um, I, well, first of all, I'm, I'm in Hong Kong, uh, as you can see from my corporate background here. I work at the Education University of Hong Kong, and I've had an interest for many years in uh, academic ethics, as I would describe it, and also other allied uh, topics related to higher education research. So uh, leadership in higher education research uh, and also academic freedom. So I, I share some of the concerns which Jeannie just talked about in relation to the surveillance of students as learners, which has uh, become an increasingly important topic, I think. In terms of this uh, symposium, I'm interested in, in the way in which many people who write about cheating and academic integrity frame this particular topic, because I suppose I frame it in my own way slightly differently, in as much that um, I think I, I had a quick look at the symposium um, obviously the all, the all the abstracts which people submitted for this symposium and um i think we had with 330 odd mentions of the word student and maybe something like 20 or 30 mentions of the word staff or academics many of which i have to confess i made and uh, some of which were very descriptive or or, or neutral uh, uses of that word so we tend to frame cheating and this symposium is called challenging cheating almost exclusively, I think, in terms of student activity. And I, I don't particularly agree with that, that way of framing it. I also think it's a shame that we tend to frame things only in terms of teaching and, and assessment, obviously, rather than more broadly in terms of other aspects of academic cheating, which would include research done by both academic staff and students and indeed other aspects you could argue into the service area. And, and finally, of course, when people write about, um, should we say, academic integrity, it tends to be everything is very negative. It's about bad things. It's about the, de you know, the degree mills. It's about 
plagiarism. It's, it's all about the don'ts and, and, and the, the evils of that, rather than, as Jeannie just alluded to, the virtues. And, and I've used virtue ethics quite a lot in, in my approaches. I also think there's quite a few important suppositions which are made about cheating, which I don't necessarily accept myself. Uh, one of these is that you know cheating is more prevalent among students than ever before. I think that's an, an implied um, supposition. Uh, and that also, you know, students in the past were somehow maybe more less likely to cheat, more moral. I, I, I think this is partly tied up to the idea that students are now more instrumental than they used to be, something for which there's very little, if any, historical evidence. In fact, the historical evidence indicates that students have always been instrumental in their learning. So this, this goes to a uh, kind of golden ageism, I suppose you could call it, that actually we, we, we need to sort of think about more carefully. And generally in, in higher education research, a lack of historical grounding when so much research is driven in empirical kind of directions. Um, I think also this idea, another supposition is that academics occupy some kind of higher moral ground, so have some kind of virtuous standard, which is, which means that you know fewer of them cheat, aside from the odd bad apple, is another kind of a supposition. And I again, I would take issue with this because uh, if you look at behaviour of academics around co-authorship, collaboration. Um, academic cronyism, there are many, many ways in which we arguably aren't more moral. Uh, we are simply a cross-section of society. Another supposition is around that we know what cheating is, because I think cheating, as we've discussed in, in this symposium, is debatable. And I, I've used the term uh, micro-cheating and given examples like symbolic citation when you know, you mention Bourdieu because you feel you have to, even though you've never read the guy and can't understand it. This kind of thing is done by academics as well as students. And that finally, another final point I'll make um, is that, you know, in some way, academics are blameless in, 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 for the fact that students cheat. It's a bit like saying, well, as a parent, I'm not responsible at all for my child's behaviour. Anyone looking at the development of children would obviously have to think about the role of the parent. And therefore, the academic as a role model needs to be looked at much more carefully from very simple examples, such as failing to ever reference in your lecture slides when you ask students to lecture in their essays, to more complex but nonetheless important ones, such as um, what's been referred to as intellectual streaking which we expect students to do in their written work, their reflective learning sometimes, but actually we are not prepared to streak or to disclose or confess to the extent that we expect our students to, or we never actually had to do that when we were students. So I think we need to analyze our own role in this as well as why students want to cheat. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Bruce. Um, I'll give my little, uh bit on me now. Uh, so I'm from Cradle at Deacon. I've done research on cheating for a while. The thing that got me into it was I was sitting in a presentation by an online exams vendor um, and they were presenting their technology and I thought I, you could cheat very easily in this online exams thing. So I put my hand up and said what if you did this and what if you did this and was basically shooed away and told, oh, no, only some very clever person could do that, or maybe it's even impossible, blah, blah. So I went and did it and published a paper about how possible it was to cheat in this despite the, the claims of the vendor. It's a type of study I've wanted to replicate with the current batch of remote proctored exams, but none of the vendors of those will let me do it that I've approached so far. Uh, and if you are a vendor of a remote proctored exams company and you'd like someone to try to cheat in your exams, please do, please do get in touch. Um, to the symposium, the Cradle team has brought a bit of a provocation of really, is cheating wrong? Why is it wrong? What is cheating? And like all of the other people at the symposium, we've brought this idea of, um, we've brought sort of a potential direction forward. 
and ours is that we might reconsider cheating or, or do away with it and just think about validity in assessment. So considering that when students cheat, the real harm is that we're not able to judge what they're capable of and that maybe we should focus on that issue, assessment, assessing what students are capable of rather than cheating. So rather than this uh, sort of behavioural thing, focus on when we look at student work, are we able to infer from it capabilities? Um, so look, that's that's me and my angle and perspective. Now, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet, which means I get to start off. Um, so I'm going to start off actually just with a bit of a, a clarification or, or a request for some more info. Jeannie and Bruce have both mentioned virtue ethics, and I wonder if either of you could speak to that a bit more and how it might be a useful way to think about this problem of, of cheating. Bruce, shall I go first and then you can continue as a philosopher? Um, right. Well, I am not the philosopher in my team, but what I will what I will say is I think that virtue ethics are specific to the roles that people are operating in. So what we hear, what we heard today in a lot of our discussion about cheating is don't don't bring morality to cheating, don't make it a moral issue, don't shame, which I think means don't shame students. Um, there are many complex ways in which students may be, may be led to cheat. Um, and Vicky actually referred to some of those. So the general thing, feelings seem to be, you know, don't make moral judgments about students who cheat. But I don't think we can keep, and I agree with that, we shouldn't shame students for cheating without understanding why they may have done that, including in relation to their engagement with the subject or the relevance of the assessment and so on. But I don't think we can take cheating or responses to cheating or the responsibilities of academics. We can't talk about those things, I don't think, with some recourse to values or virtues that hold to the role. Universities sit in an awkward space at the moment, sometimes that they, they like to say that they are not mere corporations, that they don't act in trade or commerce, that they somehow are holding true to higher values um, and it's beholden to those universities, I think, to think about those values or virtues that, that they are purporting to work with and the way in which part of their role may be to teach values and virtues to students. And I don't mean that in a paternalistic way. Universities are not the parents of, of students, but they hold somewhat of the same relationship. And I think Bruce mentioned that student that they're not in charge of students, and I would never suggest that, but they are modelling and, indeed, I'd suggest teaching certain kinds of behaviours that are precious and integral to the, to the journey that is higher education. And if universities can't articulate and hold to those values, then their place in society, I think, just starts to change very much. And we are in an awkward situation because at the same time, universities are increasingly charging fees to students and um, engaging in a transactional relationship with students. And I think it's beholden on universities to just think about what camp they're in and what's important to that um, university student relationship. Bruce, over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Lini. Um, I think it's a good uh, explanation. I mean, essentially, the virtue ethics approach is about rather than thinking about what you should do in any particular situation, it's about who you are, who you should be as a person. So, you know, very often in, in life and in making, if you like, ethical decisions and choices, these are, these very rarely, in, in truth, come to light. It's only you who knows in your heart. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, you know whether you have done something right or wrong. Um, and I mean, it is important and it gets to the heart of if you like explaining to students, getting them to understand themselves why cheating is wrong. And also it's for staff also to understand that. So for example, I've done a lot of work on co-authorship and multiple authorship. And you know, there are there is not an academic alive who doesn't have a war story, you know, they've had some degree of research about feeling they've been unfairly treated, not made the first author, second author left off a paper, you understand what I mean. And 
sometimes I was asked once in a seminar, well, why, why is this important? And I thought it was an interesting question. And I was saying, well, it's actually about a form of dishonesty because as academics, we wouldn't uh, misrepresent the data in, in our research. That We all understand that's wrong if you make something up or completely chuck away one of the questionnaires or whatever. So why do we think it's okay to misrepresent who has done what? In other words, it's still a form of deception. It's still a form of dishonesty to include somebody on a paper who hasn't written anything or to give somebody too much credit, etc. So I think virtue ethics is very useful in identifying a, po a positive set of values, but it's also about helping people to understand why certain things have a moral basis as well. Uh, th thank you both. It's um, really great to get some expansion on virtue ethics and its application. Um, and certainly my own um, layperson reading of like stoicism and all of that, it seems connected there, this, this idea that the only, the only good is in doing good in, in yourselves. Um, and certainly, actually, actually, Bruce, I want to know, so, so people who engage in this, um, these, these various dodgy scholarship practices like, um, you know, being a bogus co-author on a paper, yeah, do they knowingly do it as a wrong thing or do people say, oh, I, I didn't realise it was wrong? It's a difficult question to answer, Phil. I, mean, I haven't done the doing research into people's motivations around this are very difficult. And also a lot of people may not necessarily see that there being anything wrong in it. So, uh, you know, during the, uh, in, in the UK with the research excellence framework um, in Hong Kong here, we have something called the research assessment exercise, which is a basically a copy of, of, of the British UF. Um, there was talk about, uh, I was a former head of department uh, in the UK, and I heard quite often people saying, well, look, this particular person is uh, hasn't produced a good enough paper. Why don't we add them to somebody else? You know, this work is going on. They can kind of trail along and, and therefore we can get at least one output from them, which is three star, four star or something like that. And I mean, I argue we shouldn't do that because it's just simply immoral. But but there are um, reports that that's happened quite widely. Um, and probably not just in the UK, but in, in other countries as well, because people are responding to performative pressures. But uh, I don't think it's necessarily the case that everybody sees that kind of practice as wrong. Um, I mean, I, I, it's my best guess. It's just, uh, I, I see it as wrong, but it doesn't mean everybody else sees it as wrong as well. Mm. And we, we do have to say that particularly over crediting, like for example, there's a culture which is quite strong here in Hong Kong and elsewhere, not just in Asian cultures, which is sort of I'm helping my research team by putting them on the paper. Of course, you get the reverse where you have someone who uh, takes away credit from research students by putting themselves on papers written by the research student, which they shouldn't do in some instances. There's a lot of beliefs around this, which are based on hierarchy and power, nothing to do with ethics. Yeah, the, the idea of a, a universal set of uh, scholarly publishing uh, ethical practices sounds like it's not necessarily in existence. Um, we do now have questions rolling in. So we've actually got quite a few now. Um, so please do get in there and upvote and throw your, your questions on there. Um, at the top, we have from Ruth, I'm really interested in the phenomena of surveillance culture and the idea that if you treat someone as morally suspect, then perhaps they may be tempted to behave as such. I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts about this. Um, is there anyone in particular who'd like to talk surveillance? Yeah, Jeannie, this sounds like you. Um, so I love Ruth's question, um, and I'm sure the other panel have, have comments on this too, but I think, Ruth, that's exactly right. I mean... I think, I think our understanding of privacy in a digital age has changed and must change. And students' privacy 
is affected by many things that universities do, including um, the attempt to have um, uh, to, to use um, invigilation or proctoring technologies to observe students sitting exams remotely, but there are other ways in which universities surveil students. And I think that the use of those technologies does profoundly change the relationship between the university and students in ways we have yet to understand. And equally, I think that we need to be very careful about making statements like, well, universities have always scrutinised students sitting exams or universities have always monitored the students because the ways in which we can monitor, scrutinise and surveil students are qualitatively different than they used to be. And the use that can be made of the data we collect about students can be used in ways that we could never have imagined before. So I think that relationship has changed. And I think virtue ethics actually is, or values, is one way to think about that relationship. And I simply don't think it's right that universities would justify profound invasions of students' privacy by some abstract concerns of, well, otherwise students might cheat. Because as you say, that's a profoundly lack of trust being shown by the students um, about the way students view their studies, um, which universities need to think carefully about and scrutinise and perhaps engage with. Yeah, please, Vicky, what, what are your... Yeah. So I think um, it's, a, it's a really, really good question and we definitely know that and this is also something that is happening across society. Surveillance is more and more part of our lives, whether we go to the supermarket and we're using a self-checkout, whether, you know, it, there's a tracking of our mobile phone, uh, mobile phones and how we're using public um, transport passes, for instance. And if we think about it within the higher education system, that sort of surveillance leads to net widening. So what we end up with is capturing a bunch of people and claiming that they are doing something that is either morally wrong or illegal uh, simply because they're going about and uh, leading their lives and doing the things that they've always done. But we're changing the definitions and changing how we're viewing people and surveying people and oftentimes without their knowledge as to what that actually means for those behaviours that they've taken as being completely normal and we have normalised in any other way as well. And that effect that it has if we actually start pointing fingers at people and saying that okay this is and this isn't uh, acceptable based on this surveillance um, can also lead to labeling of individuals and we know what happens when there is labeling that is especially public uh, it can lead to individuals feeling shame feeling stigmatized and initial behaviours that might have been perfectly okay or just sort of edging towards being uh, considered outside of the norm but still acceptable behaviour, it actually leads to the individual taking on that persona and taking on that label. So we may inadvertently be actually pushing more students towards cheating uh, at the same time as we're trying to prevent cheating because we're saying, well, look, we don't trust any of you and we think you're all cheating anyway. So the response from the students may be, well, if there's that lack of trust, if there's that breakdown between uh, the university and myself or my unit coordinators or uh, teachers consider me to be a cheat, well, then what have I got to lose? I've already lost face with them. I am already not trusted by them. So what would happen if I actually started going down that path and started to do those behaviours that they're already accusing me of doing? So it's the it's a very... It's very interesting to see how we might be uh, causing more of the problem through the use of surveillance technology when we actually think that we're solving the problem. Um, Phil, can I just make a, a short additional contribution, which is that uh, I, I mean, I'm, I've written also about the uh, surveillance of students, but this is something else which relates obviously to student engagement policies in universities. And here the, 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 the ethical uh, justification, maybe implicit rather than explicit, is that the means justifies the end. 
because you know there's all this stuff about well we don't want students to drop out we want, we're concerned about them there may be some truth in that but there's also truth about the bottom line because if students drop out you lose money um and of course vpn log logins uh library swipe cards all of this stuff is bundled together to make you, your data about student engagement that you've got a I've got a score of 28 therefore that would be you'd be targeting me to try to sort of get me get me back in or get get me to engage more but I think the key thing is students really don't know what's happening around this um having talked to a lot of them I think they don't I mean quite rightly speaking they don't think universities are like Microsoft or Amazon but in truth they are aren't they because we're using uh customer inverted commas data and gathering this data and using it they might have signed a piece of paper which they don't really understand but i'm afraid universities are uh, have been gathering this information without really students understanding how it's being used um to target them and i i do think this is a this is a major issue this doesn't just obviously this relates to broader things apart from obviously just cheating as well yeah, and I, I'm sort of reminded of David Lyon's work uh, around surveillance culture and what really distinguishes our current sort of environment of surveillance culture from sort of previous iterations of surveillance. Um, you know, it's it's partly that it's mass suspicionless surveillance, so it's it's towards people who we don't have any real a priori reason to believe that they're, they're doing anything wrong. Um, and another feature of David Lyon's work is that uh, surveillance culture, people are active participants in the surveillance. It's not just done to them, they're sort of part of it. And I'm reminded of a product that Turnitin used to have where students could pay to upload an assignment and get a, a bit of a formative check for text matching. And that's very much part of that, you know, participatory surveillance. I'm choosing to do this to, to get this I may, I, I don't know, I think, they, no, my panellists probably agree with me on this. I think there's a an issue whereby what we as the university say is okay matters a lot to society, where we are sort of leaders in some sense. So when we do surveillance, we create students who we graduate with a message of and go out into the world and carry these values with you. Uh, we, we're all talking about values and integrity yeah, and whatever. I think that's precisely right. We we both, universities both have scholars that criticise surveillance, criticise the loss of agency and autonomy in the world, but at the same time are part of a machine that is profoundly engaged in the surveillance of our students and is in some way normalising surveillance. And we don't give students choices about opting out of that and we don't have follow best practices in informing students about what we're doing. So I think that's, I mean, I think that's why the value conversation is so, so important. We can't both, we can't hold ourselves out as, as different, as not corporate, and then be acting in precisely the same way as, you know, the corporations that many of us are critical of by collecting data for the purpose of nothing else than we can, and then repackaging that at, at opportune times to to reuse and um, retarget. Yeah, I'm, I think this might be the point at which I, I deviate from the panel a little. Um, I, I'm actually okay with a little bit of surveillance. And, and I think there's, um, I, I am okay with it as long as the benefits outweigh all of the, the harms. And I, as long as we have some really good evidence to demonstrate that. So I, I'd go to remote proctoring again is probably the big surveillance debate at the moment. And if, if we if we are provided with evidence of the efficacy of remote proctoring at doing the things that it's supposed to do, then perhaps that might justify some of the harms that it does. I, I'd really say, though, that the evidence isn't there in a big way around remote proctoring yet. They haven't really opened up to independent researchers coming in and seeing do their products actually but we can make a comparison with facial recognition technology so facial recognition technology is incredibly biased and we've seen it come up in the conversation that this technology is biased so it doesn't work that well 
But even if facial recognition technology worked very well, even if we remove, remove the racial and gender biases in that technology, I would still suggest we should be concerned about that technology. And my views about proctoring would be the same, that even if it works well and, and other people will have different views, it, proctoring is problematic because it's biased and probably has more uh, false positives for people um, who perhaps saints, for example, are not neurotypical or people of different ethnic or racial backgrounds or people living in, in crowded environments. So all sorts of bias problems. But even if it wasn't biased, um, facial, proctoring is, a profound, is profoundly different from mere exam invigilation. So uh, there may be circumstances, I agree, it's justified, but I think we need to work really hard to work out what they are given there are other values that are being profoundly impacted by that te technology. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think and for what? Because students can students who want to cheat are going to find other ways to cheat. Like it's why do we want to engage in this art technological arms race, to be honest? I, I think it's I think it's really complex. I wouldn't subscribe to an absolutist no proctoring ever. Um I, I think there are some circumstances where at a distance we may need to monitor the circumstances someone does something, but I'd say it's overused, or orders of magnitude overused. Um, I want to I want to attend to the questions and stop throwing little um, controversies into the uh, panel because um, we've got some great questions. Um, we've got from Sarah... Eaton, we've got, to what extent do you think academic teaching staff have a duty to report academic misconduct? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, and I think that it depends on what we're, what we're using um, reporting for, because I think it goes to, a, to some of the way in which this conversation and uh, some of the other conversations around cheating and academic integrity tend to um, fall is it tends to focus on the after the effect of cheating or academic misconduct. And I think if we're trying to use uh, academic integrity committees or academic integrity offices almost as like a university police, then we're probably um, there's there's ways in which we need to question that and rethink what we're doing uh, within the university system uh, to try and actually either support those who are, for want of a better term, sort of at risk of going down that path or a more preventative and more broader <clears throat> look at um, what we're doing to educate our students around um, appropriate academic conduct, um, better disciplinary uh, knowledge and what that means um, within each discipline, how and what ethics are and integrity is and what it looks like and what research looks like as well. So I think if it's if it's being used and there are, have been circumstances where I've seen it used by colleagues at other universities where regardless of what they saw with that student throughout the semester, regardless of the information they had gathered to make their case for um, why this student was um, acting in an egregious manner, they would send any and all misconduct straight to a committee and it was just the opinion that any form of transgression is wrong and therefore needs to be sent to the university authority to to deal with this and on the other hand there are those academics who will take the view that this is an education opportunity and none should be sent onwards and there is something for students to learn in all circumstances regardless of how serious it may be. So I think it's it's somewhere in the middle is probably the best way to think about it that there are and I think about this in regards to uh, for instance how we think about crime in society. There is a lot of people who have made mistakes that we should be responding to uh, in an educative format rather than in a purely uh, punitive format. Um, most um, 
people will tell you that of people sitting in prison, for instance, 95% should be let out and there are other ways in which we should deal with them. It shouldn't be through the most severe form of punishment we can find. And in universities, the most severe form is an academic misconduct committee. And if we're just using that to try and either do the education for us or to get rid of anything that may be troubling or to try and take the emotion out of it for us as well, I think might be a way that some people use it, that they don't need to then tell the student bad news. It's an academic committee can do the do the bad news for them. Um, then that's where we need to question how are people using it and how are we educating academics to use um, academic integrity committees? Don't know if that kind of answers the question or not. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I share a similar 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 perspective to Vicky. Uh, we used to call it hitting the big red button, you know, because I, I spent many years as a teacher in higher education, and I think it is important to you for us to still retain what I would call academic judgment. Uh, if we say every single thing. Um, has to be reported in terms of the question reporting academic misconduct. Misconduct goes on a very big scale. And so, you know, you might say, OK, what about someone who's sham paraphrasing or, you know, failing to put in a reference? They might students sometimes think, you know, when they're a little naive that they only need to reference when they're putting in a quotation or something. There's a big difference between that and somebody uh, who steals somebody else's essay. So I think we need to think about our role as educators in helping students to develop their understanding of the rules. Um, and I, I, therefore, I think it would be uh, unfair to report students up the line to a committee every time, every you know, even a relatively small misdemeanor occurs. Uh, and it would be, I would see it as part of a kind of dangerous subcontracting culture where we no longer exercise any judgment as educators. You know, pedagogic self-governance, you might call it, is something that's been eroded, particularly by COVID. And so, you know, even around assessment, where assessment decisions, uh, extensions, whatever, have been pushed up the university, justified by COVID. Um, and I think it's quite a slippery slope. Otherwise, we we will cease to lose, to have any judgment in, in, in how we're helping students to develop as learners. Yeah, look, I I remember in my first time teaching, I, I was a sessional staff member. There was a fist fight in my class and I didn't have to report that, but I was told that all instances of plagiarism had to go direct to the head of school. And I thought that was kind of a bit odd. Um, I'm going to move on to Susie McFarlane's question here. Uh, with the rise of artificial intelligence platforms that can generate written responses in seconds and other AI tools that can find and summarize research, what is the role of universities in facilitating students' ability to critically interact with machine-generated artifacts that previously required human cognition? Um, and Amy Milker sort of adds a little bit are these tools part of how people work and learn now? Are we being a bit old fashioned in our approach to these tools? But Jeannie, I think this one might be ideal for you. I am sure our panellists will have views on this one, actually. Um, so this is such a good question and I'm so glad it was asked. Um, so just last week, I teach a class and my the tutors in the class introduced me to GP GPT-3 um, and we ran a tutorial for our students on GPT-3 and asked them this very question, what does academic integrity mean to you when you can use this tool? Now, at the moment, actually, the tool's very clunky. So you might get a good essay, but you probably won't. But it, it, it's only going to develop, right? We've gone from paraphrasing tools to sort of intelligent babble from, from this um, technology. And I think it's a really good question to think about what academic integrity and, and academic virtues more broadly mean in this age of, of artificial intelligence. I'm not sure I have the answer, but I strongly believe that all students and indeed staff 
should have the opportunity to engage with and understand these technologies because that's the world we're moving into. And not to do so is shortchanging our students and and pretending they don't exist. But I think it does mean that our views about academic integrity need to change. And possibly I think it means it it, it just calls for us to have greater scrutiny of of our the way we design assessment. We had a great conversation with some of the people in the chat about designing assessment. And really the pressures on us now as universities to think about really carefully about what we want from assessment now that we know that there are so many tools out there that can help students write. Somebody said to me, does that, you know, does that mean students don't think well now? That doesn't mean students don't think well now. It means that thinking and learning and teaching are just changing. That's all for me, but I'm sure. <laughs> I actually might speak to this one a little bit as well. I very much view this as an assessment issue and one that 20 years from now, the only, the only way that we can possibly move is to accepting these tools just as we've accepted calculators and uh, the ability to write and, and all other things like that. Um, there's a couple of chapters in the Reimagining University Assessment in a Digital World book that, that address this. I, I wrote a chapter on cognitive offloading in that book, which is a way that you can view these tools as something like writing that we use to reduce the mental burden of a task. Um, and we have a long history of allowing cognitive offloading inside assessed work. We're just a bit slower than the pace of uh, technological change in, in doing that. And there's a great chapter in there by Margaret Bierman and Rose Luckin about if we do have a world of AI, what do we need to assess now? What is the role of assessment in in that world? And uh, they sort of very much support the idea of evaluative judgment being key. So your ability to make decisions about the quality of your own work and the work of others. The role of the human is, is partly around judging the the quality because that's something the machines can't really do in the same way and the prediction is in that one that in the future it will remain a human job. I think that's right Um, though I'm interested in the cognitive um, offloading argument because that's an argument that's discussed quite a lot around AI that oh well we've always engaged in cognitive offloading you know we don't have to do arithmetic and we don't have to read maps and we all manage otherwise but I think you're precisely right about this idea of judgment because there's some things that we should not delegate to machines and there's a philosopher Danaha who writes on this and this it, it may be okay to ask your virtual assistant to buy a present but perhaps you should remember that there is a need to buy the present and perhaps have a view about the kind of present Um, And certainly I suspect that most parents think that at some point in time they should read to their children and that should not be a task that's cognitively offloaded. So I think you're quite right. I think that that this this is not a firm rule, but we need to retain judgment not just about human-centred activities but just what should be offloaded and what shouldn't. Yeah, and there's also an idea around sort of almost scaffolding um, in education and what we need students to be able to do in the early years, we, we may allow them to use the tools in the later years. Um, if we imagine we're training a pilot, we want the pilot to be able to fly the plane when the instruments fail, but also that's not the norm. We want them to be able to fly the plane with access to all of the instruments. Um, Bruce, would, would you like to make a comment? Just briefly, I, I was just remembering when I was an undergraduate student, I couldn't understand anything that was being talked about in the lectures, to be perfectly honest. So I used to go to the library afterwards and and consult Encyclopedia Britannica. So this is a bit, you know, like the wiki of the old days. And, you know, so in a sense, I mean, this is to me a kind of cognitive offloading has a link, I guess, to what you could call smart scholarship or, or, or indeed uh, surface learning. Now, surface learning is, is that phrase, which is very, uh, you know, very judgmental, isn't it? Very, very negative. And say, okay, it's, it's about surface learning. But, but you know, to what extent is a lot of this stuff um, just a, a new way of surface learning, but we're nonetheless quite judgmental and quite negative in a way that isn't realistic? And it's just really partly a kind of question back to everybody, really, including uh, the panel. 
yeah, look, I'm I'm a huge surface learning fan. I play guitar and I will never claim to be anything but a surface learner of the guitar. And it's tremendously satisfying. I, I've no need for this supposedly more moral or, or better uh, deep learning. No desire. I'm also wondering how much a lot of this is coming from a place where academics are sort of the outliers they are the ones who in a certain sense were the ones who wanted to go deep in a topic and were the ones who really for want of a better phrase nerded out over a topic and that that became their thing and we are sort of sad that our students don't get that excited about the topic that we're very excited about and we want to have everyone else really love the topic that we love but we have to accept the fact that Maybe they just don't. Maybe they've learnt as much about the topic as they've wanted to learn and the rest of it they're happy to leave for us. So we're coming from a place of wanting to share the love, but we just need to accept the fact that maybe not everyone loves our topics as much as what we do. I think that's right. But I'd also, and I'd also, I think that's absolutely right. Not everybody loves the same the topic as much as we do because we are academics. That's what we do. But I'm also going to challenge the concept of surface learning when we're talking about technology. So the tutorial that we ran last week with GPT-3 was a really profound learning experience because the students learned about algorithms. They learned about the tweaks they needed to make with the algorithm to make it write better sentences or more ad or address their prompt in a more profound way. They were able to play with the kind of prompts that might, they engaged in, I think, quite deep and interesting learning. It's just that they were doing it in a way that's different from what has previously been done in the past. And quite frankly, the discussion about academic integrity was, 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 was profound because they were looking at a technology that seems to, you know, um, disrupt perhaps traditional views about academic integrity. I think that's not surface learning. I just think that's different learning. Ooh, I'm, I'm going to jump in for one moment and just do a, it's four o'clock, if people have got to move on to another meeting or something else, please feel free to. Uh, and I just want to really quickly thank Bruce, Vicky and Jeannie for being wonderful panellists and we will continue this discussion. Also want to give a really quick plug for our next Cradle seminar, which is on Monday the 14th of November, 2 till 3.30. Uh, and that's with Dr. Jan MacArthur from Lancaster Uni in the UK. She'll be talking about assessment and learning for the long term. Um, I think Jan is also someone really interesting and relevant to our conversations here because on her work on assessment, she's also talked about sort of technologies and, and big technology companies and how we need to take a critical perspective on them. So if you're interested in this, you'll probably be interested in uh, Jan's seminar as well, face-to-face -face here at Deakin Downtown or online. And you'll hear about that in the same way you heard about this. So that's the, the formal close. Now, please hang out with us for the 30-minute uh, panel after party, which is actually just more panel. So I'm going to jump on to the next question. I think we've done... Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of um, issues with the technology. Okay, great. Um, Kyle says, to what extent does an ethical and or educative approach depend on students feeling like they are members of a community of scholars? How do you think our institutions are doing in this regard? Bruce, I think that, that might really speak to your interests. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, uh, it's a very good point. You know, we, we take a kind of holistic view that, that students are part of an academic community. Uh, remember, you know, the first line, I think the first sentence of Carl Jasper's book about the idea of the university back in 19, late 50s, early 60s, when it was translated into English, it expresses that idea, you know, that, you know, we are all learners together. Uh, and I think this is partly my criticism of the cheating kind of uh, debate that we tend to talk too much about students. Um, yeah, I think there's also coming back to Vicky's really interesting point about nerding out uh, about realistic expectations as well, you know, that students are not necessarily in love or, you know, nerding out on the subject. And, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why academics you know, going 
going back centuries have written about oh well when I was when I was a student you know we were a lot more serious about being in love or interested in the subject and now people are very instrumental and you can find this in books from the 1920s and before so uh, it's partly a function of the fact that we are uh, you know we're the lifers we, we, we we've obviously decided that that we like uh, academic life and, and that we want to teach a subject and maybe our expectations of students are unrealistic but at the same time the question I thought it's re is really the point is really important that we should think of students as as, as learners with us um, because otherwise we are um, you know we're separating things out it's a bit like the same thing as separating out teaching and research and now of course we separate out teaching and research by thinking of research only in terms of outputs and grants but of course research never used to mean that it would would have meant actually engaging in dialogue with students as part of your work and we need to think of the work we do in those terms I think. Um, I also wonder whether it's not just about our students and scholars are feeling like they're part of a community because it's also about the place of higher education in society. So how does society see the place of students and of scholars where the rhetoric from a lot of governments is to see and say that universities are outside of society, that they are those ivory towers, that they are not part of understanding the struggles of people on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's the students themselves are coming into these places that are in turmoil in a way because universities are feeling threatened by how successive governments, not just in Australia, but around the world are responding to them. And the the sort of place that leaves a lot of academics and a lot of casual academics as well, when there are people in some universities, over 70% of the academic staff are there. They love the topic. They have invested their time and energy in this topic, but there isn't that ongoing safety and security uh, that's there for them. So they themselves, the academics, don't feel like they're part of that community because they can be kicked out and gone from that community uh, at a moment's notice or at the end of the semester. So it's everyone's kind of feeling displaced and not part of something greater. And it's it's speaking more to not just an individual institution, but the institution and the industry of higher education in uh, very neoliberal commun uh, communities and societies. Ah, thank, thank you. Um, I think we might move on to the next one. Um, just I'm conscious there are so many questions here and we, we may struggle to get through all of them. Uh, the next one is from Lynn Carlo Aquino, who says, I've observed that the academic integrity issue is oftentimes racialized. Educators at times may be bringing assumptions about students of certain backgrounds when they identify slash surveil students who they believe are more prone to cheating. I'd love to hear if the panel has any thoughts on this. I'll leave that one as an open one to you. Um, I would actually make the comment in relation to that, that this is part of the boundary of cheating. So um, there's been quite a lot of work done in the literature about the sort of social capital that students from well-off families with tertiary educated or professional families had in supporting them in their educational journey and sitting around a dinner table and chatting about moral philosophy or anatomy or you know the law of torts isn't seen as cheating um, but for students who don't have access to those sorts of conversations or supports perhaps the supports that students may seek may be characterised as cheating or collusion perhaps. Um, and so I think that there are sort of class and class-ridden um, and perhaps biases in how we understand and think about cheating and collusion and the like, which is a reason for being careful, I guess, in framing those, those conversations. I, I know I talk with a lot of journalists um, and have been on talk back where they've been wanting me to basically just say it's all a problem with the international students or just a few weeks ago I talked for a very long time with a journalist who was 
doing research for a story on cheating and gee we we talked for about 45 minutes and then in the end I'm not in the article at all because when I was asked is this a problem of the international students I said well it's actually very complicated and yeah here's the things when you control for you know people speaking a language other than English being an international student isn't associated with being more likely to cheat and less complexity and in the end they they went to an academic who doesn't research in the field of academic integrity or something cognate to it who was willing to say yep the problem is all those international students uh, so I think there's a there's a desire for a certain narrative from certain corners of society it was it was something that Andrew Groves and myself were looking at as part of the political discourse around contract cheating and the legislation that was introduced and looking at how politicians were framing it as they were debating the legislation. And it was fascinating to see that, as uh, Jeannie was saying, that the what families and family supports um, that were there for students was not considered collusion or cheating and in fact some of the politicians were saying well if your mum and dad edit your essay for university that's not what we're trying to um you know come down on and that's not a problem that's okay it's the international students who are the problem and they're the ones who are going out and um they're the ones being targeted but they're not the problem because they're it was almost a very paternalistic argument being made that they don't know any better um and it became it became very obvious that they themselves didn't know what they were arguing for and the argument went in all different directions and people got confused about definitions around it but at the underlying um sort of message that was being sent was that this is about ensuring um that the ideals of Australian Australianness and Australian um, fairness are what's important as part of these debates, and it was it was almost yeah this uh, pitting this idea that there's something about um, Australian students and Australian ideals and Australian morality that is something that needs to be protected at all costs because if we don't, these companies will come in and start to erode that, and as part of that erode their in their argument erode um trust in our universities as well so i don't know going back to the original question i haven't really seen it um happen and i don't know um research around it but uh, about it, how academics themselves specifically look at it but uh certainly the way our politicians and policymakers see it is through that lens uh and it's important for us to not fall into the trap of repeating that um, if I could just 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 add, I mean, uh, only very slightly. I mean, there's, there's so much stereotyping. Uh, it, you can see it in the literature of Chinese students, for example. Uh, of course, part of that stereotyping is that Chinese students don't just come from one country; they come from many countries around the world, um, and, and therefore they 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 you know their culture is quite nuanced. Uh, and also, I feel there's very often a failure to talk about the fact that you know students like everybody else in the world they have different personalities uh, so often sometimes Ch Chinese students are stereotyped as being very quiet or something like that of course uh, if you meet um, Chinese people in other contexts uh, they, they, they certainly aren't necessarily quiet so it, it probably says more about us as educators than, than about them and uh, you know you have quiet <laughs> quiet students from all sorts of uh, racist cultures, not just Chinese students. So it is a much more complex uh, situation than, than often is represented and often as Bill's given an, you know, that, that example of you know, in, the, in the media being hyped up. Yeah, th thanks, Bruce. And Matthew Hillier, sort of as a comment on that question, says that Brett Hag's research has ESL as one of the three main factors for cheating. Actually, it should be not speaking the language of instruction speaking specifically English or not is not the problem and I think it's a nice nuance there I'm reminded of I think it was Rainbow Chen who did a PhD on or, or a study I forget which on um, people from Western contexts going and studying in a Chinese culture international higher ed experience you know going to China or somewhere to do a degree and how many of the challenges that we've attributed to 
particular types of students coming to Australia or the UK or somewhere are just going and studying in a different context. They're nothing about being a Chinese person in Australia or something like that. It's just the international experience. Um, Rebecca Audrey is up next and she says, do you think that society should or does place responsibility or reliance on universities to teach those, those values of ethics and morality? If so, how can educators measure this accountably? I'm just going to jump in here and say I, I feel like a little bit icky about sort of teaching values and morality as the institution. It very much presumes that we, the educators, we, the institution, know what's right and have the capability to do that. And I, I honestly don't know to what extent these are uh, teachable things, but I'd love to hear what my fellow panellists think. Um, yeah, Phil, I think it's a very it's a very challenging question. I don't necessarily have an answer to it. Um, it does raise thoughts, though. Um, in the symposium, um, one of the things that we talked about or was raised by David Bowd um, was um, about programmatic assessment, as sometimes it's called, and some, you know, talking about having specialist um, assessment units compared to teaching units, trying to reduce over-assessment in universities. And I think here there may be a link uh, to this idea of responsibility uh, for universities to teach ethics and morality. I mean, in connection with what it means to be a student, um, if, if we did move down the road to have, uh, as some institutions are trying, to have these sort of units that just assess students and others where they just teach students, that could open up space, legitimize space, which we often need to, to do in the curriculum for students to have a much more nuanced, much more detailed case study type led approach to, well, you know, how do you understand academic integrity and, and plagiarism, stuff like that. And Margaret Behrman was talking about some of her work there. And I think that would be quite valuable, but the people doing that need to be well, really specialists, people with an interest, with skills in that area, because our colleagues are not necessarily interested in that. They may be teaching history or English or maths. And they may not particularly be interested in, in, in teaching about ethics and morality. So I think um, that, that, that may open up a possibility of, of doing that. But I think we do need to take more responsibility as academics to engage with students about what this all means in a more meaningful way uh, it comes back to that point about you know do's rather than don'ts you know virtue rather than just sort of well here's a list of things you can't do or we're going to kill you kind of thing and I, I do think that is important for us to explain why something's important and what's the moral reason behind it rather than just don't do it because it doesn't convey as as educators we need to convey the reasons to students for things not just tell them no even my six-year-old daughter wants to know why and that is the question you never want to hear anyone stop asking even though as a parent sometimes you hear it too often um, I'm just going to say I love that approach <laughs> um, and I think that's entirely right we we we're in an overcrowded curriculum, we can't teach everything, but when we're setting assessment tasks and talking about them, we have a choice about how we engage with those tasks and we can talk to students about why we think this assessment task is meaningful and how we are hoping the students will engage with the task or we can choose not to. Um, but we're making a statement about the virtues and values of assessment by whichever path we take, I think. Sort of got just two examples, one as a student and then one as something I'm, I'm doing now. As a student, I studied um, at a Hungarian university and the government um, decided that there were certain subjects that every student, regardless of whatever discipline and whatever degree they were studying for, had to study at least one unit and that was philosophy. And so that was regarded as uh, essential. Um, we also had to do uh, one IT uh, unit as well to understand technology that we'd be using. And it never occurred to me to 
do anything like that, but because it was compulsory and it was mandatory and we all went through it and chose our, our philosophy units from a long list that we could choose from. And I think that was because it was something that was expected to be done in the first year, it had an impact on the way that I thought throughout the rest of my degree as well and the sort of subjects and electives I chose because of that. And I wouldn't say that that made me or that made the students going through the Hungarian system any more moral. Um, we can see what's happening in Hungary today. It's not the case. Um, but it certainly... Um, I, it's something that I suggest to all my students um, as they're studying their criminology uh, units or, you know, if they're in a social science major, or sometimes I get students wandering in from a, a science or an accounting um, or law background to go, just go off and study a bit of philosophy because you might have a different way of thinking about um, what it is you're, not only what you're studying, but what your place is in the world and the sort of things that you want to bring to uh, whatever direction it is you decide to go to in the future. And as part of the, the assessments that I give and the way that I structure my, my units, I think it goes very much to that point of explaining to the students why it is I've structured something and scaffolded things the way that they are. And it's about being, and saying to the students, sometimes I've we're focusing on this because it's something that's important to your understanding of criminology, but that's not an area that I have expertise in. It's being vulnerable and showing vulnerability to students at the right times as well and showing to them that it's okay to not know everything. And sometimes I think the the, the cheating um, and academic in, integrity issues arise because the students think that they need to have all the answers because they think that we have all the answers. And that puts them in a position where they feel like if they don't get the answers right, then there'll be a judgment as to whether they should be at university or whether they're in the right sort of field and whether they are worthy of, of studying um, the field that they're studying in. And I think it's it's explaining the whys and the hows and the thinking that goes on behind it and saying to them, look, if there's something that you think should be done better, then speak up about it because I want to know. I don't have that experience of being a student today. I did it a while ago. So, you know, I've got those experiences and those ways of thinking about things, but I'm always interested in how you're learning currently now and realising that, you know, those those days of being able to spend a lot of time sitting and delving deep into uh, those topics that I was interested in isn't always there for my students. So it's it's opening up ourselves and saying to students, yeah, we're the experts in a really niche topic and we love that topic, but everything else around that topic as well, we might not be uh, the number one person to, to go to on this. So we're learning with you as well at the same time. And I think if you have that vulnerability there, it makes students feel that they can approach you when they've got those insecurities because you're sort of demonstrating that it's okay to have them. Thanks so much. Um, I found that to be a really interesting um, set of perspectives on sort of our role in communicating and, and teaching, if, if we can, the ethics and morality there. Um, we are close to the end, so I just thought I'd give all of the panellists an opportunity for sort of a, a final thought or a final word or something people should go away and think about or, or look up whatever it's just it's kind of your last little moment to ha have a say um before i do just to give the panelists a chance to think about it just going to plug that upcoming cradle seminar on the 14th of november with jan MacArthur. um another opportunity to come and talk and think about assessment so my, my fellow panelists do you have a final thought I'll be jumping in there, which is, Philip, in preparation for this um, seminar, I read your book, which I really enjoyed. And I will be going out and reading work by Bruce and Vicky. Um, and I would encourage everybody here to do the same, actually. Um, I'm a lawyer and <laughs> reading outside my field has been delightful in relation to this topic, serious as it is. 
Oh, th thank you for the plug for all of our work, Jeannie. I'll use my little bit at the end to do the same, really. I think you know, my fellow panellists have written on very, very different aspects of, of all of this. Um, and their work is very much worth following up. And if you look at the bios for everyone on this panel, you'll see links off to, to us and, and our work in the field. Uh, well, I think maybe as a final thought is that what is happening with students in universities, Alyssa, it's a lot of strong feelings. And I think a lot of those feelings come from a place of genuinely caring about the topics and genuinely caring about what is is happening with our students and with ourselves as academics as well in our place in society and I think that that often means that it elicits a response in us where we want very punitive um, uh, responses sometimes and I think the members of the public might feel that uh, as well that it's it's unfair it's the wrong thing to do and I think if anything, what we've what we've learned and what we've heard about um, throughout the symposium and um, from the panel members here as well is that oftentimes that isn't the solution to our problems and the issues. And if we go back to why we're doing what it is we're doing, it is from a place of wanting to share our knowledge and share our interests with people. And so if we're taking academic integrity and cheating from that sort of perspective, it's very much about trying to focus on uh, prevention and reigniting that interests and support um, for one another and for our students or for academics as well who may be struggling uh, and it's coming and we should be focusing on that place rather than just trying to you know strong arm people into doing things one way because we know that that doesn't work and especially if it's highly punitive it will have the opposite effect to what we're trying to achieve so I think if, if there's a takeaway it's going back to why we are doing what it is we're doing and um, wanting the best for each other and for our students and for our colleagues as well. Oh, thanks so much Vicky and, and I think you know, that, that thing that you started with there of we're in this because we all care so much about it, I think is definitely true of uh, my experiences and especially at this symposium. Everyone's come along because they, they really do care about this issue despite having diametrically opposed views sometimes. Uh, Bruce, any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I've really enjoyed it and, and I've learned a lot from all these different perspectives. Um, I kind of self-identify as a higher education researcher. Of course, it's not, you know, it, it's not something you say you want to become when, you, when you're growing up, like a fireman or whatever. But, uh, you know, the interesting thing is it's, it's a huge field uh, which only really exists from what we draw from, from different disciplines. And so this is really where the interdisciplinary approach is so important here. Um, so I think that's, you know, it reinforces the importance of us looking broadly and widely in terms of what we can learn about this. Um, so that's, thank you so much for in, inviting me to being part of it. And uh, thank you to my fellow panellists as well. Oh, thank, thanks so much. It's been a joy engaging in that sort of interdisciplinary or even uh, transdisciplinary, as Sarah Eaton talked about at the opening. Um, so that that's the panel. Thanks everyone so much for coming along and participating. Particular thanks to Vicky, Bruce and Jeannie for a wonderful chat here. There'll be a recording made available that you can share with people and a blog recap. And you can look forward to the outputs from the symposium as well. We're going to go away and write better work as a result of, of having had these conversations. So thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye.